Hello, what is up guys? Welcome back to chapter 5.1. In the last video, we learned about the working principle of a typical crystalline silicon solar cell, the solar cell IV curve, some important photovoltaic parameters, and also explore the data sheet of a typical commercial crystalline silicon solar cell. In this video, we'll be learning the typical silicon solar cell structure, and also explore the theoretical efficiency limit of a typical solar cell called the Shockley Quasar Limit. This video series is proudly sponsored by RS Grassroots Education. You can refer to the Design Smart article link below to find out more materials related to this video. Now, let us cut open a generic crystalline silicon solar cell to understand the different layers and its functions. This is the general design of most of the solar cells out in the market today. This is the M layer, called the emitter, which is very thin, about 0.3 microns. Most of the thickness of the solar cell is made up of the P layer. This is where most of the light absorption happens. Next, we have the anode on top of the emitter, a heavily p doped back surface view, and finally, the cathode. There are quite a lot of things going on here. One of the most asked questions by students is that why is the P base so thick while the N layer is so thin? Well, the reason for that is to bring the PN junction as close as possible to the top of the solar cell, where most light absorption happens. When electrons are excited in the P layer, they form minority carriers. Minority carriers have limited diffusion lengths and can recombine very easily if it does not travel to the depletion region in time to be swept out by the electric field. This limited diffusion length can be represented by what is called a minority carrier lifetime. The next common question is why do we need to have a heavily p doped back surface field? Well, the reason for that is to introduce an energy barrier such that electrons won't be able to reach the cathode contact. This is because the contacts are usually full of defects that allows minority carrier recombination. Finally, it is obvious to us that the anode has to be perforated, usually only covering 10% of the top surface as to allow as much light as possible to come in. The anode are the lines you usually see on top of the solar cell. Now in the previous video, we discussed that if a solar cell has a low energy band gap, it will absorb the most amount of photons. If it has a high energy band gap, it will absorb less photons. Since photons contribute to photocurrent, does that mean that the lower the band gap, the better the efficiency? Well, this is not the case. A low band gap solar cell will provide us with the most amount of current, but it will give a very low voltage. This means that yes, a low band gap solar cell can technically excite a lot of electrons, but collectively, these electrons don't do much work for me. These electrons do not have enough energy to drive through the resistor. We need these electrons to do useful work for us. On the other hand, a high band gap solar cell provides us with a low current, but with a very high voltage. Let us imagine a solar cell with a band gap of 0.8 electron volts, which is relatively low. If a photon of 1.5 electron volts strikes the solar cell, all of the energy will be transferred to the electron and the electron will be excited by 1.5 electron volts, which is much higher than the band gap by 0.7 electron volts. What happens is that this electron will eventually release energy as heat and relax down to the edge of the conduction band. This energy is wasted as heat and will not contribute to power whatever the solar cell is trying to power up. Remember, the energy 
from the electron is what drives voltage through a resistor. And we couldn't just have the electron, but without the energy. Otherwise, there wouldn't be sufficient voltage. We know that the maximum power of a solar cell is power equals the field factor times short circuit current times open circuit voltage. Smaller band gaps gives higher short circuit current but low open circuit voltage. Larger band gaps gives high open circuit voltage but low short circuit current. So, theoretically, there must be an optimized band gap that gives the optimal voltage and the optimal current to provide the best power. In 1961, William Shockley and Hans Kreuzer were determined to find out this optimized band gap. They used a set of theoretical equations and plotted out the theoretical efficiency of a solar cell versus its energy band gap. It was found that at an energy band gap of 1.1 electron volts, it produces a maximum efficiency of about 32%. This 32% is famously known as the Shockley Quasar Limit, which is a theoretical limit for the maximum efficiency of a single junction solar cell due to the trade off between current and voltage. This is why silicon, which has a band gap of 1.12 electron volts, is so commonly used as a solar cell material, since it's very close to the optimal band gap. Now, there are ways that researchers have tried to surpass this limit. However, these methods are not under the normal working mechanism of a PN junction solar cell that we discussed earlier. These all fall under the third generation photovoltaics category, which we will also discuss in the next few videos. That's it guys for chapter 5.1. In this video, we learned the typical silicon solar cell structure and also the shock equator limit. In the next video, now that we have learned how a solar cell works, we are now going to learn how a solar cell is made. Take care and goodbye.